Welcome everyone. Tonight, the Literature and Works Division of Modesto Junior College Visiting Author Series presents an evening with Luis Valdez, Zoot Suit, Then and Now, The Impact of the Arts on Civic Engagement. I'm Dr. Teresa Rojas, Professor of English and Professor of Ethnic Studies here at MJC, which is located in California's Central Valley. I'm also the director of the Latinx Comic Arts Festival, where we recently celebrated this year's event virtually. And you can see all of the panels and talks by visiting the Latinx Comic Arts Festival on YouTube. We're here tonight through the support of the Associated Students of Modesto Junior College, our Literature and Language Arts Dean, Jillian Daly, and the members of the Promotions, Publications, and Special Events Committee, PSEC. Thank you, everyone. We are live streaming directly to YouTube. Tonight, I will introduce our visiting author who will begin his talk, during which we encourage our live stream audience to post questions and comments directly to YouTube. We'll be monitoring the chat, and as time allows, we'll take your questions. And now, what a thrill. Luis Valdez is regar regarded as one of the most important and influential American playwrights living today. He is the founding artistic director of the internationally renowned and OV award-winning theater company El Teatro Campesino, the Farm Workers Theater, which he established in 1965. In the heat of the United Farm Workers, the UFW struggle, and the great Delano grape strike in California's Central Valley. His involvement with Cesar Chavez, the UFW, and the early Chicano movement left an indelible mark that remained embodied in all his work even after he left the UFW in 1967. But this has remained close to his own farm worker roots. El Teatro Campesino is located 60 miles south of San Jose, California, just about 80 miles southwest of here in Modesto, in the rural community of San Juan Bautista, California. This theater tucked away in San Benito County is the most important and longest running Chicano theater in the United States. Among his notable works are his early actos, Las Dos Caras del Patroncito, and Quinta Temporada, short plays written to encourage campesinos to leave the fields and join the UFW. His mitos or mythic plays, Bernabe and La Carpa de los Rascachis, Rascuachis, that gave Chicanos their own contemporary mythologies. His examination of Chicano urban life in I Don't Have to Show You No Stinking Badges, his Chicano revisioning of classic Mexican folk tales, Corridos, his exploration of his indigenous Yaqui roots and mummified deer, and of course, the play that re-examines the Sleepy Lagoon trial of 1942 and the Zoot Suit riots of 1943, two of the darkest moments in LA urban history, Zoot Suit, considered a masterpiece of the American theater, as well as the first Chicano play on Broadway and the first Chicano major feature film. Luis Valdez's hard work and enduring creative career have won him honorary doctorates and countless awards, including LA Drama Critic Awards, Drama Log Awards, Bay Area Critic Awards, the prestigious George Peabody Award for Excellence in Television, the Presidential Medal of Arts, the Governor's Award for the California Arts Council, and Mexico's prestigious Aguila Azteca Award given to individuals whose work promotes cultural excellence and exchange between the U.S. and Mexico. In 2019, his play Valley of the Heart opened to rave reviews and sold out audiences at San Jose Stage Company. It is my great pleasure to welcome the award-winning playwright, director, actor, and educator, Luis Valdez. <laughs> Thank you, Teresa. Thank you. <laughs> Well, it is my pleasure to be here to address this community of uh, Modesto, the junior college. It is uh, significant this evening uh, to speak about Zoot Suit and to speak about the link between the arts and civic engagement, uh, because it is, uh, of course, the 94th birthday of Cesar Chavez. And in some ways, you can't begin to talk about Pachuco, so you can't begin to talk about Zoot Suits without embracing the whole history. And the fact is that uh, Cesar Chavez was uh, an ex-Pachuco. 
And so I would like to uh, begin by uh, reminiscing about some of my memories of Cesar Chavez. 80 years ago, uh, this is in 1941, I was a one-year-old. And uh, I was born in a labor camp, a farm labor camp in Delano, California. That's uh, down the Highway 99 from Modesto. And uh, the year after that, uh, a family came in from Arizona with two teenagers, a 14-year-old and a 13-year-old. And uh, one was Cece and the other one was Rookie. Uh, eventually, I was to learn that uh, Cece was really Cesar Chavez and that uh, Rookie was his brother, Richard. And uh, they were migrant workers coming from Yuma and uh, joining the thousands of people that were streaming across the Southwest at that time, virtually in the creation of California agriculture. Now, my whole family had come to the Delano area in the 1920s. Uh, it's, uh, again, not so strange that even 15, 16 years after my family arrived in Delano, I was still uh, being born in a farm labor camp because that was basically the whole reason that Delano existed. It was a huge uh, labor camp uh, utilizing not only Mexican workers, but also Filipinos and uh, African-Americans, what was left of them. And, uh, and the Okies, you know, the famed Okies from the 1930s were still there. I grew up with the whole diverse uh, panoply of human beings uh, in the fields. I thought everybody was a farm worker. But in those days, uh, Delano was pretty active and had to stay active uh, because it was a day and night operation. There were packing sheds there. And uh, there was a lot of prostitution, quite frankly. You know, it was a small town, less than 10,000 people. But as, as I have learned, there were about 13 houses of ill repute. And that was really to satisfy the needs of, uh, of all the male workers that there were single men that were coming and going. And so it was also a town that saw a lot of trafficking in terms of the drugs that were available at the time. Uh, there was marijuana on the streets. Uh, not that I knew about that, but I learned that later. And, and whatever it takes to keep young men uh, working in the fields. And uh, it was only natural then that in the 1940s, um, the Pachuco culture took uh, root there. And so uh, in my childhood, uh, is, uh, I was five or six is when I first uh, became aware that there were zoo tutors in the world, that there were pachucos in the streets. And as it turns out, one of them was uh, a guy named Cici. And uh, I didn't uh, meet him in 1941 when he got into town, but by 1946, 47, I was six, seven years old. And um, he used to come uh, hang out with uh, one of my cousins who used to be my mother's favorite. So he spent a lot of time at our house. And these pachucos would come in, and uh, to me, they looked like giants. You know, they were dressed in, in their zoot suits, and they were cool. And uh, one of the incidents that had happened back in the 1940s was uh, related to the segregation in the movie houses. The Delano Theater, like I'm sure Delano, the, the movie theaters in Modesto and in Merced, and way up and down the whole 99 in the San Joaquin Valley and the rest of California were segregated. And so in the, the Delano Theater, if you were Mexican or Black or Filipino uh, or Japanese, you had to sit on the sides. And only the white people sat in the orchestra section in the middle. So uh, Cece had gone off to the Navy and, uh, and had come back. And he was on a date with a young woman who became his wife. And he decided, since he was serving his country, that he was going to sit in the middle. And so the manager came, the usher came running first. He says, yeah, sir, you can't sit here. And he says, why not? And he says, well, it's not allowed, you know? And then uh, Cece wouldn't move. So then uh, the manager was brought and uh, Cece still wouldn't move. So then uh, they called the police and uh, they took Cece and all his friends were really shocked. They were saying, oh, oh Cece's in trouble. He's gonna go to jail. He's gonna be locked up. But the fact is that there was no law in, in 1946, 47 that uh, legalized uh, that kind of segregation in the movie theaters. So they grilled uh, CC for a couple of hours and, uh, and then but finally they had to release him. And all his friends knew, oh my God, they said CC got away with it. So the next weekend, everybody went to the movie theater and sat in the middle section. And that was a desegregation of the Delano Theater. I saw this with my own eyes, I was a kid, but I remember that we had to sit on the sides or we sit up on the balcony because we weren't white. So here, uh, here was CC desegregating the Delano Theater and changing it forever. And so when I went uh, back to Delano to join the grape strike, uh, my mother said, you're gonna join Cece. And I 
I said, Cece, is that guy still around? The vato still around? And she said, mijo, don't you know who Cece is? It's Cesar Chavez. So I reconnected with Cesar Chavez and, uh, and of course joined the grape strike. And it was on the picket lines of the Delano grape strike uh, that El Teatro Campesino was born. Uh, Cesar was quite honest. He said, uh, you know, there's no money to do theater in, in Delano. There are no, no actors. There's no stage. There isn't any time to rehearse. We're on the picket lines day and night. You still want to do it? And I said, absolutely, Cesar. What an opportunity. The fact is that I've been already stuck with, struck with the, the bitten by the theater bug from the time that I was six in school. And, and I wanted to do something. And so uh, I, I went to uh, Delano to volunteer uh, on the picket lines. And about a month in, I was elected as one of the picket captains. And that gave me the opportunity to work on, on the picket line and to control uh, the chants and the songs that were being sung and, and the kind of demonstration that we're making out in the fields. And El Teatro Campesino began to really take shape. What really shaped it was the March of Sacramento in 1966, 25 nights straight in a row, days and nights, marching all the way from Delano to Sacramento, 350 miles, 360 miles, uh, through all the back towns. And it was a revolution in the making because this was the first time that the campesinos had been able to really express uh, their views of their own life and the demand for social justice. Now, it's important to realize that this Pachuco experience that I'm talking about was basically an urban scene in the middle of uh, uh, the biggest rural paradise, you know, in, in the United States, which is the San Joaquin Valley. We are the breadbasket of America and we feed the rest of the world through our labor. And that uh, history began back in the 1920s as, as farm labor was being industrialized. My own parents came from Arizona, from Tucson on trains. The growers were importing workers, you know, without charging them very much, all the way from Arizona to the San Joaquin Valley because they needed a workforce. And so in Delano, what you saw was the planting of King Grape, and that happened all the way up the whole San Joaquin Valley. King Cotton, you know, what they did is they drained to Larry Lake, which was, uh, Delano was, existed right on the edge. Delano in early March existed right on the edge of Dooley Lake. The Indians used to fish there and there was a big wake, uh, a big lake out there every year because of the snow melt that would come down into the valley. Well, the growers came in, they, when the Americans took over in California, a lot of people from the South came in and they were cotton growers. And what they did is they drained the lake and uh, that soft sandy bottom became the breadbasket, became the place where they planted cotton. And so the first big wave were the cotton pickers who came in and that became a source of, of employment for campesinos all the way until the early 1950s, 52, 53, when the mechanical cotton picker came in and put everybody out of work, they, got, they had machines. But the grapes stayed on and are still uh, labor intensive, it's hands-on. And so they, there's still a need for farm labor. But interestingly enough, in Delano, because it, it had such a, an intense urban scene in the streets of Chinatown with, uh, with the, the marijuana and the drugs, actually that people had to take in order to keep working, young men. Uh, what developed was this other culture, was other consciousness. And so uh, the Pachuco consciousness uh, took root. It had really started in East LA, but because it was an urban scene that could be translated up and down into the whole San Joaquin Valley, uh, it took root in Delano, it took root uh, in, in Bakersfield, of course, it took root in Fresno, it, it took root in Modesto, it took root all the way to Sacramento, all these city centers in the middle of the San Joaquin Valley became uh, uh, places where the Pachuco culture flourished. And uh, what's interesting, I think, is that uh, even though Pachucos are associated with uh, with criminality, and I'll get to the Los Angeles case in a minute. Uh, one of the things that I noticed about the leaders of the United Farm Workers at the very beginning, starting with Cesar and his brother Richard, but also his cousin uh, Manuel uh, Chavez and Gil Padilla, the, these are the original officers of the United Farm Workers. These were veterans of World War II and of Korea, but they had some of the Pachuco sense. They had the coolness, they had the, the sense of humor. Uh, they were sophisticated. And that impressed me, you know, which is one of the reasons that, that I, I went there. I, I was too young to have been a Pachuco, but I was very impressed by their leadership because they were confident. 
And that is something that they got from the Pachuco experience. Now, where does that Pachuco experience come from? Well, the big case, the Sleepy Lagoon case in, in, in Los Angeles occurs in 1942-43. Uh, members of the 38th Street Gang uh, were rounded up and arrested uh, for the death of a Chicano at, at, at a ranch outside of, uh, of downtown Los Angeles in what is today uh, the city of commerce. Uh, but uh, at that time, it, there was a reservoir out there. And since the Mexicans weren't allowed to swim in the, in the pools, the public pools, uh, the, the kids would go out there with their girlfriends and, and use it as a lover's lane and swim during the day, you know, when, when the, uh, the, hot, uh, when the sun was up. But the thing is that uh, the gangs at night started to fight over this place and uh, one night there was a rumble and uh, one of the guys uh, ended up dead, uh, Jose Diaz. Now the, the law in 1942 was reacting to the national changes that World War II and Pearl Harbor had imposed on the country. And so uh, LA was becoming a, a center of war production with factories and, uh, and also recruitment. You know, soldiers were coming through Los Angeles on the way to the Pacific. And so, uh, the law started to crack down after they rounded up the Japanese Americans and put them into concentration camps. You know, 120,000 uh, Japanese Americans uh, went into 10 concentration camps all the way from Arkansas to Arizona and California. Uh, and so uh, I wrote a play about this called Valley of the Heart, about uh, Heart Mountain, uh, uh, about the love story between a Chicano and a, an Anisi farm girl. The, or the daughter of a, of a farmer. This was produced in LA uh, most recently in, in 2018 and uh, at the Center Theater Group. But in any case, uh, uh, what was happening in, in Los Angeles, in the streets of Los Angeles was a reflex of the ongoing constant racism that had uh, always existed. And so uh, the Pachuco experience was really a defiance of this. It was the young people, and not just the guys, also the girls, there were pachucas as well, who were defying their families uh, for the sake of their boyfriends or just for the sake of their own pride and dignity and, and standing up for the human rights. And uh, they created a culture that, that fit the urban development of East Los Angeles. Now, East Los Angeles was evolving into the urban center that it is. It is, uh, Los Angeles is the second largest concentration of Mexicans on planet Earth outside of Mexico City. And so some of the culture of Mexico City came through the Pachuco experience. It came by way of El Paso, including uh, the possibility that the very term El Pachuco really is another way to say El Paso, because the Pachucos were calling El Paso El Pachuco, El Pachuco. And so they, they made their way west and came to Los Angeles and all of the vatos and, and the rucas, you know, that were out there became pachucos and pachucas. They were into jazz, they were into dancing and they, they were into whatever would make love more, life more agreeable, life and love more agreeable. Ironically, the very heart of the Pachuco community in Los Angeles was uh, the Bunker Hill district, which is right downtown. Uh, these had been famous old uh, mansions back in the 19th and early 20th century. Uh, but by uh, 1940, uh, they were run down slums. So uh, uh, the heart of the Pachuco community was in the corner of Temple y La Main, uh, Temple y La Main. And uh, today's uh, music center where Zuja was produced is on Temple and Grand. So it's right in the heart of the Pachuco, the old Pachuco district. Except, of course, that they removed the slums and they created, uh, well, the Civic Center, they created the Music Center, they created Disney. It, it's the new Los Angeles, you know, it's the new cultural heart of L.A. But back in the 40s, it was the Chicano, um, it was the Chicano community. And, of course, East L.A., East L.A. has never gone away. It, it turned into, into uh, what it is today, you know, way back in the 40s. But before that, it had seen the Irish, it had seen the Jews. So that whole experience of Los Angeles turning against its minorities is not new. Uh, the moment that Americans came west and landed in Los Angeles, they turned against the Mexicans, uh, who were quite frankly multiracial. You know, we all know that Pio Pico and Andres Pico, uh, they, they they were black and they were Latino and they were Indio and and 
that sort of set the pace for what Los Angeles was going to become. And the Pachucos were right there with them. I mean, the Pachucos came in all shapes and sizes and colors. But uh, what offended, I think, the authorities was the fact that here are these brown kids dressed up in these outrageous suits. It was an attempt by these brown kids who had come out of the rancho. Her parents had come out of the ranchos of Mexico and out of the, the ranchos of the San Joaquin Valley and were trying to find a cultural expression that would allow them to feel cool in the middle of this growing megalopolis called Los Angeles. And so um, they dressed up in their suits and went downtown where they were rejected and, uh, and rounded up by the cops. And, and the Sleepy Lagoon case is just the most outrageous example of this. The 22 members of the 38th Street, supposedly so-called 38th Street gang, were put on collective trial, on mass trial, and uh, 12 of them were convicted of first and second degree murder. Four of them were sent to prison for life to San Quentin. Uh, in 1977, I was invited by Gordon Davidson of the Mark Taper Forum to come LA, to LA and, and, and participate in a play about LA history. And so I chose the Sleepy Lagoon case and the Zoot Suit riots the following year as my subject matter. And so that became uh, Zoot Suit, the play. Uh, it, uh, it ran for uh, a year. Uh, it was seen by close to half a million people. It still holds the record for uh, the greatest attendance of any play originating in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, even the, the revival uh, a couple of years ago beat the old record. And so it, 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 still has, uh, it still has a lot of spirit and a lot of attraction for people because I think it hits a nerve. It's a nerve in, in, in the history of California and also in the history of race relations in America because uh, the system would love to keep us as wage slaves. The system, not just the agricultural system, but also the, the urban system that keeps us, if not as uh, wage slaves, as farm workers, but as dishwashers and as cooks and as what have you, you know. They, they, uh, they're more comfortable, the system is more comfortable seeing us as uh, on the fringes and as, as service providers. There's no indignity in being a service worker, uh, provided that you get paid what you deserve and, and that you get treated with respect. But that is not the case. That is not always the case. And so uh, it, it's, it, the Pachuco experience really hits at the need for people to retain and achieve their dignity, not just in the farms, but also in the cities. And I think this is why Zoot Suit has remained uh, relevant. Uh, uh, ironically, uh, the whole gang system in Los Angeles has gone international because they, uh, when they, uh, they deported uh, Mara Salvatrucha, you know, back to uh, El Salvador, uh, what the authorities did is that they, in, in industrialized and internationalized the drug trade, basically. And what's ironic is that there's Mara. Mara was the name of one of the barrios, is Maravilla, you know, in East Los Angeles. And the reason it was a Maravilla, which means marvel, was because the early immigrants that arrived in the teens and in the 20s in Los Angeles were found it to be marvelous. It was a marvel, que maravilla, you know, that there were paved streets and public transport and, and electric light and running water, hot and cold. Una maravilla, but those barrios turned into, into the hotbed, you know, of, of gang activity. Salva, of course, comes from El Salvador. And trucha is just an old Pachuca term, meaning uh, get wise, get hip. So Mara Salva Trucha today is one of the purveyors of international drug trades, you know, and they're part of the reason why we have so many immigrants coming from Central America, because things have gotten out of hand as far as, uh, as the conditions in their home countries. So in some ways, you know, again, this, this recalcitrant, stubborn attitude, racist attitude in the U.S. that led to the deportation is still part of that whole attitude that the United States has to the rest of Latin America. The United States started out as the colony of England at the same time that all those countries in Latin America were colonies of Spain and Portugal. But uh, once the U.S. went independent, it turned into, into, again, the guardian supposedly because of the Monroe Doctrine of Latin America. But it's really the oppressor. You know, it, it recolonized the colonies. And so to this day, we're having troubles at the border, troubles, you know, because we refuse to acknowledge that all those countries 
in Latin America are part of America. And they are just as desirous of, of democracy and just as desirous of, of economic stability as everybody else. And uh, rather than going down there, get bananas or drugs or, or to sell guns, you know, the, the US uh, of A should, should be helping them to achieve their humanity. But that's not the case. And, and uh, the fact is that we're living a whole narrative here that puts minorities in inferior positions because of it's good business, you know, because it's one way to keep people in their place. And so uh, if you don't educate them, if you don't give them higher paying jobs, if you don't give them executive positions, then you can keep them suppressed. And, and worse yet, if you can keep them from voting, that's even better, you know? So what we're faced with is, is a, a condition that it's not as bad as it used to be, but it's it comparatively speaking, it could be a lot better. And uh, we need more activism. We need the spirit of the pachuco, the defiance, the pride, the the sense of smarts, you know, the sense of humor that I found in those early uh, days in the huelga, you know, with Cesar and Richard and, and Manuel and Gil Padilla and Dolores Huerta. And there, there's another pachuca for you. She was a good girl, actually, but uh, her spirit is, is she's she's the embodiment of, of again, of, of female power. And uh, it comes from the same period. It is uh, that first generation right after World War II that stood up collectively for their rights and opened the way for the rest of us. You know, it was a question of beginning to get organized and for us to pull together and to do this uh, in, in some reasonable way. Now, the way that I chose to do it is through the arts. And so I went to Cesar because I felt that uh, there was nowhere else that I could really do what I had to do. Uh, the theater has also been segregated uh, from the very beginning. And it was even in college, I, I couldn't get on main stage because there were no roles for me. The color line kept me out. So I did a lot of readers theater, which was fine as far as I'm concerned. But but the fact is that I realized I had to write my own stuff. I had to become a playwright in order to put my people up on stage. And so the way to do this for me was to join a movement. So I joined the farm workers movement, one, because I've been a farm worker, but also because it was alive and powerful and real. And so El Teatro Campesino launched on the picket lines of the Delano grape strike. And uh, within two years, we were in New York, basically performing at the Village Gate Theater. Uh, before 2000 striking social farm workers, uh, social workers. And so it began then what is now the Chicano theater. And uh, what we need in our time is art that speaks to our social necessities, that speaks to our political needs, and that is able to generate enough hope and excitement in people, enough pride and consciousness to keep them active. And so uh, that's the reason that literature has existed at all times. And it's the reason that the theater really got started in the first place, going all the way back to, to our, our Mayan ancestors, you know, the Aztecs and the Maya, you know, who used to put on great spectacles. Nobody knows about it because that kind of stuff was forgotten and never completely studied. But as the future goes on, as we get more Chicano and Chicana scholars coming in, and Latin, uh, I hesitate Latinx, you know, I understand that people like to use it. Uh, uh, I, I think that begs another question as to who the Latinos really are, because the original Latinos were the Romans, you know, and it's because of the Roman Empire that we're all still uh, wrestling with that narrative. So there's a question of a whole narrative that needs to be addressed, and it can only be addressed through the arts. It can only be addressed through history. It can only be addressed through scholarship. And so uh, this is the reason why uh, the arts will remain relative to civic engagement. It is the one place where you can get in the theater, you can get people together live to have a formal uh, exposure of social problems. You know, the spe theater speaks for all of us. It speaks for the collective we. And so uh, when the Teatro Campesino was born, it was the beginning of, of Chicano Latino theater and the collective we, we were putting ourselves, not just on stage, but also on film, also on video. We were beginning then to define ourselves. And that is the first step that you, any people needs to take in order to participate in the democratic uh, experiment in civic engagement. And, and uh, if you have actors, you know, you'll have better public speakers. And so, 
Cesar realized that, so I, I, I began to lose all my actors very quickly on the Delano Grave Strike. In order to keep the Teatro alive, I had to pull back. And so I withdrew the Teatro from, from the Grave Strike in 1967, not because we were abandoning the strike, but because we were jumping into it. And I needed to be able to set the Teatro up so that we would survive and we could train our people. And so we moved to Del Rey, we were there a couple of years, we moved to Fresno, and finally in 1971, we came here to San Juan Bautista, California, an old mission town, where we established our school. And this has been our school for Teatro uh, since then. We're going, we're going to be celebrating 50 years in San Juan Bautista this year. We've been around for 55 years now as a Teatro Campesino. Uh, a half a century is nothing in the history of, of, of a people. You need to deal with the thousands of years of human history. So this is just the beginning. And I look to the young. I look to those students that are in college getting a higher education for them to take their role as definers of history, be they writers or be they poets or filmmakers or scholars, historians, scientists. It doesn't matter what the role is, but the participation is direct and it, all of us live with the creator in our souls. And if the arts can help you to express your creativity, all the more power to you, all the more power to us, because ultimately we're all the same. There are no real distinctions. The race is, is a non-entity, it doesn't exist. Mexico is the most diverse place on earth in terms of languages and in terms of genetics. I don't know if you've kept up with the, with the scientific investigations, but it has always been tremendously diverse, as diverse as our plants, as diverse as, as the food we have always eaten. So uh, Mexico is the key to the future. I think that the relationship between Mexico and the United States is one of the most dynamic relationships on planet Earth, and it will bear new fruit in the future. And Teresa, back to you. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. We have a couple of questions from our audience um, as I have traffic going on over here. So in another interview you gave at uh, UCSD about 12 years or so ago, you said that in writing the plays that you wanted to write, you realized that quote, early on, there, were no, there was no context for me within which to exist. So I had to do everything that I could in order to make that possibility happen. And in doing that for myself, then I ended up doing it for other people, end quote. So could you talk to us a little bit about what that experience was like in specifically in creating that space for yourself in the theater world? Well, you know, it began in some ways when I was a kid because uh, working in the fields, I mean, you, you spend a whole day out there and, uh, I started working out in the fields when I was six years old with my folks. I was on the migrant path actually when I was one year old. Uh, that's another story altogether. But the fact is that um, as when you're a kid, you know, your mind, your mind is, is, is still growing. Your brain is still growing and you're still making connections. So uh, I, I, my hands were busy. My body was busy working in the fields, you know, picking whatever we were picking. But, but uh, my mind was, was loose, was free. And so I began to imagine what I was going to do. I, be, I used to imagine that I was going to make this or that. Once I learned the secret of paper mache, I could make masks, I could make puppets, I could make whatever. Uh, wood, I discovered this bamboo. I used to make toys, airplanes out of bamboo. You know, I used to love a nice piece of bamboo. But the fact is that uh, what I saved me then from absolute drudgery was uh, the creative impulse. And, and so early on as a kid, I created a creative space for myself to save my soul. And, and uh, even though I was too tired to carry through with some of my plans at the end of the workday, uh, I could still uh, do stuff on the weekends, you know, on a Sunday or something and, and carry through. And uh, I began to play uh, with my friends, you know, making puppets and stuff. The thing is that that idea of creating a space for myself became really relevant and important when I faced my adulthood. You know, once I graduated from high school, I said, okay, what am I going to do? And uh, I loved mathematics and I loved science. And I graduated from high school in 1958. Now this is the year right after Sputnik. So the emphasis was on STEM, you know, it was a sciences, technology, engineering, and math. 
And, uh, and that was okay with me. I was ready and prepared to become an engineer. I had an older brother that became an engineer. So I said, I, I'm willing to do this. But I also missed the creative aspect. And what I discovered was that um, basically I was being trained to be a technician. You know, I, uh, uh, I, I was not going to be able to be a, a nuclear physicist. I was not going to be able to be a brain surgeon. So uh, I wanted the freedom that the arts provided me, the freedom to express myself. So I did a foolish thing, you know, I, I switched from the security of math and sciences in a, a guaranteed profession. And I became an artist, I became a playwright, you know, I, I decided I was going to be a playwright, not knowing that it was going to give me a job, you know, to support myself. I had no idea what the hell I was going to do. It's just that I wanted to be creative. And so I used to walk through the drama building, you know, and breathe it in. So in my second year at San Jose State, I switched majors. I was a straight A math and physics major. And so I switched to English with emphasis on playwriting. And I began then to write plays, but then became pretty clear to me that there was no room for me in the professional theater. There was nobody there that, that could truly appreciate what I was trying to do. Although I did have a lucky break, you know, William Saroyan, I don't know if you know his name, he was a great American playwright. And uh, John Howard Lawson, who was the founder of the Hollywood Guild, also a playwright, saw my first play, The Shrunken Head of Pancho Villa at San Jose State. And, and they welcomed me into the American theater. And that was a, a mind blowing experience for me to say, they said, this is an American play. You have written the first Mexican American play. And, and uh, so I knew that I had to create a space. So I took my plays and went to San Francisco to try to find my future. I joined the San Francisco Mime Troupe and I enjoyed working in the parks. That helped later when I did the teatro. Uh, but there was no room, there was no playhouse, no place that I could function as a playwright. So I realized I had to create my own space. I had to create my own existence, my own place to be. If I was going to be a playwright, I had to lay the groundwork to allow me to exist. And that's why I joined Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta, and uh, I created Teatro Campesino, uh, even though, I mean, I was no longer a campesino. I, I was a math and physics major, you know. Uh, I, 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 was, uh, I could have gone into the sciences for all that. But what I appreciated most on my trip back to Delano was that I was re-educated completely in campesino culture. I, I, people like Felipe Cantu, who became uh, one of our founding members, Cantuflas, we used to call him, you know, <laughs> like Cantinflas, Cantuflas. Uh, but Felipe Cantu, uh, who played the snake man in La Bamba, by the way, that was his last role. Uh, he, he, he taught me so much, and he and other campesinos taught me so much in terms of of the culture, you know, the, the humor, the, the twist, the turns, the music, that I, I, I kind of went to the university again, but this time it was with campesinos. And the space then got even more interesting. So here in San Juan Bautista, we created a space that is safe for our people. They, they, we are in charge of our own space here. So we don't have to play second fiddle to anybody, you know. Uh, the Chicano expression is, is what we're about. And so we don't have to make any excuses. We can define our reality as we see fit. And as God has given us the wisdom and the spirit and the talent uh, to do. Well, this relates perfectly to um, Paul Mary Yusuf's question, um, question to Mr. Valdez. How do you start organizing and writing a play to address discrimination and oppression to emphasize and transfer the right message. He doesn't quite say what the right message is, but how, how do you even begin? Well, you know, with the octos, we, we had five points, you know, it's, it's uh, I'm sure I can remember them. It's uh, one is to reflect what people are thinking. Uh, two is to um, always hint at a solution. Three is to activate them into action, you know, and uh, oh my, there are four or five points, you know, that, that have to do with, uh, Use humor, use a sense of humor. Uh, my advice to people uh, that are just starting out is start small. You know, the actors were tiny little things. Uh, they, they, and out on the picket line, you know, we started out like little weeds, little seeds. 
uh, we used to do one or two minute pieces up there on the picket line because it wasn't a theater. You know, we were, the people were working out there and we get on top of a, of a flatbed truck, get on top of uh, the panel truck and, and shout at the workers, you know, from there. And, and all of this eventually translated into short uh, bits and actos that we did at the union meetings, the weekly meetings. And those were really five minute and uh, 10 minute uh, pieces. Mostly we tried to lift the, lift the spirits of people, you know, and activate and keep them uh, in, in the struggle. But there are so many things that you can do. You can eliminate, you can uh, illuminate the issues of, of any complicated social condition that people need to know. People need to be educated, you know, what they're struggling for. And so keep it simple, keep it down to earth, keep it funny if you can, keep it entertaining. And, uh, and don't expect too much. It'll grow on its own. <laughs> I was muted. I love that. <laughs> I want to share a couple of comments from our YouTube audience. Catalina Martinez says, I just want to say thank you. My 17-year-old daughter just read your book of early works and is now fortunate enough to hear your history and how everything you wrote comes together. Oh. And Melanie Beru, who, who is faculty with us at MJC, says, thank you, Mr. Luis Valdez. Thank you for your life's work. Your work has aided in helping us Chicanos, us, equis, fall in love with ourselves. And for that, I'm eternally grateful. Gracias. That relates to a, a question, um, actually, that I have in having, having taught um, Zoot Suit a couple of times and for everyone across the board so far, it's their first time reading a play mm. in the play format. And it is so transformative. It seems as though it's a magical entryway for our students. They've never had, they've, or maybe they've never thought of reading a play in that form. They, they know about going to plays, they know about watching film, but what do you think it is about the, the, the dramatic form and reading it in that form that is so transformative for readers, for new, especially new readers, new audiences. Well, you're talking about the transformation of drama into dramatic literature. And I think that's important, uh, I mean, vital, that in some ways the actos were the beginning of Chicano literature, you know? It, uh, they existed as improvisations until I wrote them by hand, and then my wife and compañera Lupe typed the whole thing, and we published the actor book with the teatro on our own. You know, we 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 didn't wait for a publishing company; we just did it, and then we sold them at uh, at the second uh, Chicano Theater Festival. You know, which helped to spur the Chicano theater movement. Uh, I think what we're talking about here is is a process that that is natural, which is the evolution of art in too many different kinds of forms. And, but the idea of literacy is, is extremely important. It is the idea of, of taking your thoughts and your feelings and putting them out there into some format that takes them out of you and into a public sphere. And so you're beginning to create community through that, right? Uh, I have uh, a new book coming out that uh, is called Theater of the Sphere, The Vibrant Being. This will be published, uh, it's being published by Rutledge out of London. It, uh, it will be on sale in July. Uh, it is the whole aesthetic of El Teatro Campesino as we have evolved it based on Mayan thought. And so I take the, the Mayan sacred calendar, 20 pasos, and translate them into the exercise. I didn't do it in the book. I, we did this way back, you know, across 50 years of improvising. As I say, Teatro Campesino has been a school. And so we needed to teach ourselves and we needed to root our, our aesthetic in something that was completely ours. And so um, I wrote this book then as a consequence of 50 years of, of practical experience. It's got exercises, it's got philosophy. I think people will find it relevant in our time because uh, we need to define ourselves as the original inhabitants of America. We are the original Americans. And, and so uh, we need, uh, we need to put down our roots in the very continent that belongs to us. You know, it, it, uh, we go by many names, but Latino in some ways uh, means that you're, 
your peripheral, your 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 you're a colon, you know, you're a colonized person, you know, but if not by the Spanish and by the Romans, um, we have a deeper history than that. You know, we are, we are the Greeks and Romans of the new world. That's who we are. We, we, we had architects and brain surgeons and we had hydroponic uh, systems. You know, there were, there were toilets of flushing water in San Juan Teotihuacan at the time of Christ. I mean, if anything, uh, you know, we've been duped into believing that we're nobody. When as a matter of fact, we're the other major world civilization. We are the inheritors of all those thoughts. And so I, I wrote this book, uh, The Vibrant Being. Uh, it was Theater of the Sphere, because that's, that's the concept. The Vibrant Being. Uh, because that's what the Mayans called us. We need to, we were all, we are all vibrant beings vibrating with the universe. And so the ex exercises that we have developed in El Teatro Campesino have been, uh, have been expressions of these ideas. And so I hope that uh, they'll be useful in schools and in, in not just for Chicanos, but for everybody because it's universal. I love it. So let me ask a quick question before we before we go on. And that is, so we have more questions coming in, but I want to make sure that if there's more that you would like to discuss in terms of, of presenting, that we get to that first, or we can continue with questions, whatever your preference. Well, uh, I mean, there's a number of things that, that some images, you know, that that I have. Great. So let's uh, go ahead and do that. Uh, okay, let me see. We're going to have to share, share, and vis-a-vis uh, -vis what I was saying about uh, about the indigenous. Uh, one of my images disappeared here. I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, well, let me just uh, start with this one. This is uh, from 1972. We had uh, a special in Los Angeles and it kind of encapsulates everything about the teatro, you know. Uh, over here on, on the left, down below is the, the farm workers, but then uh, this was all live. Uh, this is just a straight photo of the shots. But uh, it's got the Diablos, it's got the Calaveras, it, 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 it's got the, the different characters. And up at the top is the Sol. This is Noe Montoya, who was playing the sun god uh, at this moment. And he just passed away. He was one of our maestros. And we lost him uh, with the, the COVID-19 last year in April. And uh, he went fast. You know, he got it and he formed us. He, he, he was getting better and then a week later he was gone. So it's, it's really a horrible loss. Uh, this is what I was trying to find from before. This is San Juan Teotihuacan. This is the initiating uh, festival, the, the event of the Quinto Festival de los Teatros Chicanos in 1974. That's the Pyramid of the Sun up at the left-hand corner. And we're facing the Pyramid of the Moon and, and then what we're looking down here is the Avenue of the Dead, so-called Avenue of the Dead. But look at this majestic, fantastic place, you know, that is San Juan Teotihuacan. There's evidence that they not only reached down south, all the way down to El Tajin and Copan, and helped to establish uh, those places, you know, with, with Toltec influence, but they reached north as well, all the way to what is today Kansas City, you know, is Tahoutia, Cahokia, uh, in, 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 in the Mississippi. And, and uh, the Mississippi River Valley. And so what we're talking about is a pre-Columbian culture here that was continental. And so in 1974, we opened up our, our Teatro Festival in celebration. And what you see here is the Teatro performing the recreation of El Baile de los Gigantes, which is based on the Popol Vuh. And, uh, and we did this with, uh, well, with, uh, our, our compañeros, you know, in, in native costume here. And uh, some of them are, are no longer with us, but the years have, uh, have begun to decimate our ranks. But in any case, uh, this image remains from, from that time. 
And uh, as you can see, we could we could perform uh, we could perform um, specials, you know, in Los Angeles. But we could also like uh, uh, go back to uh, the original stuff, you know. And this is this is really amazing uh, that that we have this opportunity. We live in America, and we are the roots of America, and yet we're treated as if we've never existed. And I, 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 I don't say this in defiance of anybody because I love the cultures of the world. I love the cultures of Europe. I love the cultures of Asia, of Africa. Of, uh, you know, I have nothing against uh, other world cultures, but I think that we are the embodiment of this new world culture. You got to remember that. And so what, if they're arguing about Chicano studies, we should be doing American studies and starting in 3000 BC. Not not uh, in 1940, uh, 1492, 3000 BC, which is the date at which uh, El Quinto Sol uh, is born in, in the Mayan calendar. Some of that is in my book, so people may find it interesting. Let's go to some more questions then. Uh, Mercy Cat Lolo asks, how much impact did choosing the music for your plays and movies have on your, your, your creative process? Music? Yes. Well, I mean, music has always been part of the work of El Teatro Campesino. It, it, we're a very musical kind of theater company. And uh, from the songs of Lalo Guerrero, you know, that I utilized uh, in Zoot Suit, to the, the corridos, you know, that we started with, we, we help, I'm proud to say, uh, to create some of the standards of the United Farm Workers Movement, right? The Farm Workers Movement. Uh, and, and these were born in the hot spirit of the moment, you know, in the, in the struggle. One of the things that is amazing about music, if you're facing goons, if you're facing people that may do violence to you, but you start singing and you sing as a group, it has a power, it has a vibration there. There's something that, that is very odd if people uh, start beating you up when you're singing. It happens, it happens, but it's not nearly as likely to happen if you're putting up a strong vibe that's going against the potential violence. This is where the music uh, has, has become a force in life itself. It's curative, it's inspirational, it is, uh, it, it is one of the elements of reality. Very good. Uh, Valerie Peña Alfaro says, I'm an older student focused on making my second act be about social justice and educating future generations. What do you think is key to inspiring students to become future Chicano leaders? I think you need to know your history. You need to know, I mean, again, we speak of the huelga, you know, being 56 years ago, and that's, that's a blink of an eye in terms of history. It's nothing. Uh, I, I look back and, and you know, we, we need to understand what it is that the Spanish and the British were trying to do. You know, they were coming from Europe and, and they wanted the spice trade. You know, they, they, they wanted to find a way to get to the Indies and get the tea and get the pepper and get the different spices. And they never knew or even suspected that America was there. They never suspected that our whole world was in the way. So when uh, they arrived uh, in the guise of, uh, well, Balboa came, you know, and, and, and he climbed up to a peak in Darien, they say, and discovered the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> I mean, there's a whole, uh, the biggest ocean in the world, you know, and, and he discovered it, which gave Magellan then, Ferdinand Magellan, the opportunity to go around the bottom of, of South America and make it all the way to the Philippines where he met his fate. He was killed there, you know, by a, a, a Filipino chieftain uh, uh, in, in Cebu. Uh, but anyway, um, the fact is that they were looking to circumnavigate the globe in order to establish trade, which is something that the Romans had started way back in BC. You know, London was established in 50 BC, the city of London as a trading center by the Romans. In 48 BC, two years before that, two little towns were established by Julius Caesar 
in Extremadura, where most of the conquistadores came from. One was the town of Trujillo, which is uh, uh, a word that came out of Torre de, Cesar, de Julio Cesar. The, the Tower of Julius Caesar gave us the name Trujillo. That's my wife's maiden name, Trujillo. And, and but next to it, 50 kilometers is the town of Guadalupe, where the Virgen of Guadalupe came from. Now, these was established by the Romans, by Julius Caesar. So we've been living a Roman reality through the Roman Catholic Church for 500 years, for a thousand years, 2000 years here, you know, well, 1500 years. And, and the thing is that, that you need to know this. If you don't know the shape of history, then you don't know what's affecting you today. And you don't know, have any inkling of what tomorrow might be like. Uh, what I'm saying is that we weren't just a stopping off place. Mexico was not just a stopping off place for Spanish and, and the British, you know, to, to get to the West Indies, to the Southeast Indies. We are a world unto ourselves. We are the other half of the, the human race, the other hemisphere. And we need to be respected as such. And we need our autonomy and we need our cultural dignity. And again, if you don't know your history, you don't know what you're missing. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned your wife a couple of times. And um, would you mind telling us a little bit more about her role as an integral part of your work over the years? Well, my wife is my partner, totally my partner in life. I believe in, in, in marriage. We've been married uh, uh, 51 years. Uh, we met in the struggle. As a matter of fact, uh, we met when uh, the march to Sacramento came from Delano to her little town of, uh, of Cutler. In, outside of Fresno, 16 miles southeast of Fresno. And, uh, and so uh, uh, we were doing nightly rallies and so she came to the rally. And two years later, uh, as a student of Fresno State, she came to a teatro presentation and, and she joined after that. After she graduated from Fresno State, uh, she became a teacher teaching African-American kids in West Fresno but uh, she had the bug, you know, she, she was always tempted to run away with the circus. And so she finally did. And uh, she was in the group for a year, you know, before we were romantically involved. But I saw the, her qualities as a person, I saw her as an artist and also as a human being. And, and, and that's the foundation of my love for her. You know, it, it, we have mutual respect. She keeps me honest politically. Uh, but we share uh, so much and uh, she has quite a circle of her own. You know, the uh, have a whole comadres in San Juan here that, that deal with social issues. Most recently, the racism against Asians, you know, in the country, they had to make their own political statement. And of course, with the COVID, they've also been involved in seeing that everybody gets vaccinated, which is uh, a, a direct, uh, on, on, uh, direct service, you know, to our community and people around us particularly campesinos and, and Mexicanos. Uh, but in any case, uh, I believe in a good partnership. You know, it, it, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a marriage, you know, as, uh, even between the same sexes. I think people can love each other and enhance each other through their love. And we all need somebody, you know, we need somebody. It's a lonely universe, but uh, it, 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 she's my mirror and she's my heart. I love that so much. <laughs> Actually, let me, let me check something here. I was going to check yep. something. Uh, uh, bum, 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 bum. I'm looking for our, our wedding show. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I should have these labeled. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, next time. Hmm? Next time. Next one? <laughs> next time. Next time. I love the yeah. tech support in the background. That's the best thing. You can hear her, yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, here she is in one of the actors. This is Lupe right there with her fist Got raised. Uh, when we were performing uh, on one of our tours. And so she was an actor uh, uh, in the teatro uh, before, like I say, before we were man and wife. And uh, it, it, is, it is a question of mutual respect, you know, and, and I think it began with our politics. She always says that she fell in love with my politics uh, before she fell in love with me. And, and that's cool. You know, I, I appreciate that very much. And uh, I, I embrace that. 
Uh, here's another shot of Lupia right there. So uh, she was in Shrug Ahead of Pancho Villa. Uh, she was playing my daughter, actually, in Pancho Villa, Shrug Ahead of Pancho Villa. Uh, people thought I was, I had uh, robbed the cradle, you know, when we got married, but, uh, <laughs> but, but we've been married for 51 years and we had three uh, w wonderful sons, you know. Congratulations. And so, um, yeah, so, well, there you are. So I'm going to stop to share now. Here you go. Thank you so much for sharing that. I am, we are, we're running out of time, but I have a couple more questions for you and then we will, we will bid you farewell. Um, but since we are in the Central Valley and um, in my introduction, I mentioned that, that you haven't strayed far from the Central Valley throughout your career. And so I want to ask you, what do you think, um, the, being from this area and staying in this area and being based in this in the Central Valley, what does that bring to your work? What what critical elements do you think that brings to the development of your work? Well, when you think of the importance of the San Joaquin Valley uh, to the world, I mean, it isn't just the state of uh, California. You know, we we're the breadbasket of the world here, and and so uh, I understand now my experience and how, how my family has contributed to the evolution of what is the San Joaquin Valley. You know, we, we weren't just wage slaves. We came and gave our sweat and blood and, and, and our bodies, you know, to, to the evolution of this state. And, and we deserve recognition. Cesar used to talk a long time ago, he used to tell, you know, he said, this strike isn't just about wages, he used to say. We're about democracy. Because out of this will come leaders, will come School boards will come, city councils will come, mayors, eventually the governor, you know, and that's that, that's so true, you know. It's it's such a down to earth struggle in the San Joaquin Valley because it's big and broad, and fertile, and 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 just as fecund as hell, you know. I mean, it's it's it it's uh, for every reason, you know, that keep people laboring there. It 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 will continue to thrive, I think, because. It, it's, it's needed, you know, it's unique in the world. There isn't another valley like it. You can go all over the country and then the world and look for a place as big, as broad, and as deep as the San Joaquin Valley and you won't find it. And so uh, it is unique, you know, and I know a lot of people consider it to be a backwater, you know, it, it's, uh, I call it the heartland of California, you know, but, but, uh, uh, places like Modesto to me are incredibly exciting because there's a, every time I go to Modesto, I'm really impressed by the vitality of the place. And it has changed a lot in my lifetime, but I, I can see it continuing to thrive. It's tremendous. You know, the businesses that are going up, the people that are working, it, people, uh, campesinos are not just staying campesinos anymore. They are beginning to, they have evolved. And the fact that uh, we're talking under the aegis of an educational institution here, Modesto Junior College, I think is all the more relevant that our people uh, acknowledge the importance of getting an education, of uh, becoming bilingual as quickly as possible, but also not to lose that spirit of the pachuco that allows you to be cool in an urban setting, that allows you to manifest your own destiny and also to take control of the elements that determine your health your well-being and your prosperity. That's fantastic. I always end my uh, my classes and some of my, the panels that I'm on with telling people to tell the stories that you want to see in the world, right? Because mm. if you don't see them, then write them, tell them, create them. So what is something that you'd like to leave us with, in addition to what you've already shared, what is maybe one last thought that you'd like to leave us with? Well, we were talking about Zoot Suit. Let's end with Zoot Suit. And a lot of people don't realize that El Pachuco and Zoot Suit is a superhero. I mean, I grew up with Batman and, and Superman and Captain Marvel, all those, the comic books, you know, way back in the 50s. And, and so when I created the character of El Pachuco, I wanted one, he's an incarnation of Tezcatlipoca, you know, who's like the dean of the school of hard knocks in Aztec culture. He's one of the gods. He's one of the, the, the magic twins, you know. He's Tezcatlipoca. Quetzalcoatl is his brother. They're, they're brothers. Quetzalcoatl is the eagle, the sun, and uh, Tezcatlipoca is the jaguar, the jaguar knight. 
And so he's the nighttime. He's, he's, he's the subconscious. Uh, so he's a God and, and he's superhero. He's, a, he's and, and maybe that's why Zutsu continues to be popular because nothing can touch him. Even has a line that says it would take more than the U.S. Navy to wipe me out. You know, it, it's because he's supernatural in that sense. And, and we need to think of ourselves in those terms, not just the men, but also the women. Of course, we've always had the Virgen de Guadalupe. So I, 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 we've always had La Divina, you know, we've, we've had her. Uh, but El Pachuco is, is not exactly La Virgen de Guadalupe, but he's, uh, he, he's, in, the, he's in the neighborhood, you know. And, and so we need to think of ourselves as, as supernatural, you know, that we are beyond our human limitations because that's the only way that we can really move forward. You know, we need, without getting blown out ego-wise, we need to dream and we need to dream as big as we can, as wild as we can, and keep pushing into the future. What a wonderful final thought there. I'm, I'm already in that zone where I'm ready. I'm so ready for it, right? <laughs> All right. Mendes, I want to thank you so incredibly much for being here with us today. I want to thank Lupe for the tech support. Thank you so much. <laughs> and um, it, is, it is my pleasure to be part of the Central Valley, to be here in Modesto, California, and to be part of Modesto Junior College and the Literature and Language Arts Division. So once again, on behalf of the college and on behalf of everyone who attended, thank you so much to our YouTube live stream audience. Once again, don't forget to create the stories that you want to see in the world. So good night, everyone. Have a wonderful day.